If you've got Bibles, turn to Genesis chapter 24. You get your money's worth today. Um, this actually is the longest chapter in all of the book of Genesis. It's actually longer than the creation account. And this is really just a love story um, and why there are 67 verses. I was thinking, how can I split this up into two weeks or three weeks or six months? Um, and really, you have to read it all together. There's no way to split this up. So that's why I'm telling you, you're going to get your money's worth today. Before I get into it, though, I remember it like it was yesterday. I accepted Jesus when I was 20. I was at Washington State University down in Pullman, Washington, doing a business degree. And uh, I realized I wanted to be a pastor. I felt called into the ministry. And I guess almost 30 years later, that calling was true. Um, and so, as it were, I was finishing a business degree, and I wanted to go to seminary. And I was just going to finish that business degree when I went into council for my junior year. The counselor told me, no, 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 you, you, you want to do it. If you want to be a pastor, you already have enough for your business minor. Yay. <laughs> um, you can switch to a history degree. History is so much more germane and apropos for its ministry. Early Middle Ages, late Middle Ages, made, excuse me, late Middle Ages, the Greeks, the Romans, Protestant Reformation, all of those classes. Man, I soaked those up. And I was so excited about my newfound faith. And I was pretty vocal about my faith. I was radically excited and couldn't wait to become a pastor to preach God's Word. And while I was at WSU in those history classes... Um, how many of you know that it wasn't really a very religious or Christian university at all? It was a very secular university. How many even know more so in a secular university, if you're taking history classes, more often than not, the PhDs that are teaching those history classes don't have a faith of their own. They're, most of them, at least my experience, most of them were very atheistic in their approach. And so as I was getting to know and sharing and being real about my faith, I heard phrases from some of those professors, from some of those people in the classes. Um, I wasn't obnoxious, but I definitely raised my hand at times and asked questions about the things that they were saying, especially when it came to the early Middle Ages, when it came to even the Romans and the Greeks, when it came to uh, Jesus, because there was part of the classes they were very secular and atheistic, and I was not. I, I love the Lord, and I want to talk about my faith. But I heard phrases like, well, you know, when you put your faith, or when you became a Christian, you took a leap of what? You took a leap of faith. I was like, a leap of faith? I didn't take a leap of anything. You know, I, I, I was 20 years old. It took me quite a while to actually submit my life to Christ. I was a real knucklehead. And uh, so it wasn't some leap this was a calculated decision, but ultimately, I, Jesus grabbed a hold of my life. And I, I didn't hear just a leap of faith. I also heard you have a blind faith. And I'm like, what do you mean I have a blind faith? You ever heard that phrase before? You Christians, you, you all have blind faith. Or you silly Christians, you've just taken a leap of faith. And of course, those phrases and others like that, are meant to disparage our faith, meant to in some way denigrate our faith, in some ways make us look like we're silly for having faith at all. And you know I've talked about faith in general over the years. Faith is something everyone has. I don't care if it's faith in yourself, faith in the engineers that put these trusses up or designed these trusses, and the contractor who put these trusses up and then the roofing guys who put the roof on top of the, the engineer's plans and the contractor's truss work, and then finally the sheathing and whatever else is up there. You, you had faith when you sat down this morning in these chairs. Now, Church Ranch used to have different chairs. And if you remember when we first started as a church, actually nine years ago this weekend is our anniversary. We're nine years old. It was actually March 21st. 2015, but because March 21st doesn't land on a Sunday, this is the closest one to it. But when we first started, the chairs that we sat in for probably, I don't know, maybe six people, uh, they actually folded and crashed. And people, during my messages, oftentimes I'd hear, kapak! We'd look back and somebody would be lifting up and, you know, 
Now, don't worry. I mean, Eric took care of that. I know, buddy. He, he got new chairs. But you had faith when you sat in that chair. We had faith when we walk into a building. You had faith, have faith, when you get in your car, that when you push on that brake, it's going to operate the way it should. And for that matter, you have faith that the surrounding people on the road know what they're doing. Sometimes they don't, right? <laughs> but the reality is we have faith all over the place, in general in life, but also about grander things and bigger things in life, about the end of life and about what life is all about and all of the rest. So to me, the whole leap of faith, blind faith, it's really a straw man is what I'll call it, right? A straw man. And when someone builds a straw man, that's literally building something up that they can just knock down as easy as possible. You know, they can make you feel silly and stupid. But the reality is, I don't think in any way that we take a leap of faith I don't think in any way that you and I possess or have blind faith. In fact, today's story, if you've got Bibles in hand, Genesis chapter 24, we're going to read this whole thing. We're going to see how it is that God ultimately um, is a part of our faith, and it'll make sense at the end. Let's read it together. Now Abraham was old, well advanced in age. How old was he? At this time, Abraham was 140 years old. Three years, or excuse me, for, for him it was three years because he was 10 years older than Sarah. Sarah died in the last chapter at 127 years of age. Abraham would have been 137 years of age when Sarah, his wife, died. And so now we read three years later, 140 for Abraham. He had been walking with the Lord at this point for 65 years of his life. How many of you are older than 65 years old? Hey, you're bold. You're raising your hand, right? Uh, how many of you have walked with Jesus for 65 years of your life? Yeah, that's awesome. Abraham has been walking with the Lord for 65 years of his life. And so when it says he was old, it means he was old. Now, he's going to live to 175 years. He still has 35 more years on this earth. And ultimately, we're going to see in a couple of chapters that he gets remarried to a woman named, cool name, Keturah. He has a whole other family, believe it or not, and I'll talk about that when we get there. But that's where Abraham was at, well advanced in age. And it says the Lord had blessed Abraham in how many things? In all things. And you know what pastors always like to say? We looked it up in the Hebrew. We looked it up in the Greek. All means all. It's not funny, but people like to say that. He had blessed him in all things. And remember what God said in Genesis 12 when he first called Abraham? I will bless you, he said to Abraham. And he said, I will bless those who bless you and I will curse those who curse you. And so 65 years later, all of that has materialized. Abraham is truly blessed in all things. But I want you to realize when it comes to the blessings of the Lord it's not without its cause. It's not just something carte blanche or default. Every one of us experience the same kind of blessings in our spiritual life. It is not cookie cutter because there are people who are obedient in their faith and there are people who are disobedient as Christians. And there is a different blessing for those that are obedient, obedient in their faith compared to those who are disobedient in their Christian life. Abraham, as we have seen, has been obedient to what the Lord has called him to do, has he not? From the very beginning, Abraham has obeyed the Lord. Not perfectly, but Abraham has obeyed in the main the things that God has asked him to do. So he was blessed because he was obedient he was also blessed because he lived a life of faith, which means he trusted the Lord. He put his faith in the faithfulness of God. And I want you to know that's not always the case for every believer. Just as every believer has different levels of obedience to the Word of God, the commands of God, and the calls of God on our lives, there are different levels of people's faith in the faithfulness of God. Some people struggle because they don't have much faith in the faithfulness of God because they don't know the character of God very much. They question God's goodness. 
They question God's activity and why he does certain things that he does. They wonder and they even doubt oftentimes who God is and why God does what he does. Not everybody has the same obedience. Not everybody has the same faith. But for Abraham, he had both. And he had those things in great amounts. He also was blessed because he lived a life of worship. If you look at his story, if you look at the things that the Bible tells us about Abraham, more often than not, we see Abraham building an altar, which means he had a portable church, right? Wherever Abraham went for the most part, the Bible tells us that he built an altar to the Lord, and then he would sacrifice on that altar, which was their form of worship today. It's like what you do every Sunday when you come to church. You might come for the coffee to a small degree, maybe for the free pastries. I know I eat a few of those. There's burritos over there. You know, the worship's good. Uh, Hopefully the, the teaching, hopefully the pastor sticks to the word. That's half the battle right there. But the reality is, folks, more than anything else, why I believe that we should and do go to church is that we might worship the Lord. That we might focus our hearts and our minds not on the pastor behind the pulpit necessarily, not on the worship team, not on the fellowship or the building, not on necessarily the coffee and the donuts and whatever else. Those are a part of it. But more than anything else, my prayer is that when people come to church is they want to meet with God. They want to meet with Jesus and hear from Jesus, right? They want to give Jesus glory and praise, even in the songs that we sing. All of it is worship. Fellowship is worship. Uh, Coming together and and reading his word, that's all worship. And what Abraham did in that form of worship, he didn't have a church building to go to. He didn't have coffee and donuts, not that we know of. He, He didn't have a pastor that he sat facing the same way behind a pulpit, listening to the pastor preach. When Abraham worshiped, he built an altar which was a stone altar with a platform on top. He took one of his many animals and he slit its throat, poured out the blood, and then offered that animal on that altar as a burnt offering to God. That was his form of worship. And we see him doing that over and over and over. And that, let me just tell you, it pleases the Lord. When you and I come in here and our heart's desire is to meet with Jesus and to hear from Jesus and to give Jesus praise and glory and honor for his goodness in our lives, I want you to know the Bible says it's like a fragrant incense, aroma coming up into, the Bible says, the presence of the Lord. It's what later on that God would tell the Israelites, I want you to build an altar of incense. There was a brazen altar in the sacrificial system. If if you go through and you read Exodus, which we're doing as a men's ministry on Wednesday mornings at nine o'clock right here in the harvest room, join us if you can, guys. We've been reading through the book of Exodus. And one of the things they did was they built a a brazen altar, an altar where it is that they would uh, take the the blood from the uh, sacrificial animals and they would sprinkle that on. But then at all times they had this altar of incense and that altar was always burning this incense as a symbol of their worship going up to the presence of God. And I want you to know it pleases the Lord when you and I worship Him. He's honored and He's blessed when you make the choice and the decision. When I, like Abraham, make the choice and the decision to live a life of worship as believers in Jesus Christ. Amen? He had a life of obedience. He had a life as we said, of faith. He had a life of worship. He had a life, as we've seen him interact with people, he had a life of integrity. He had integrity in the way that he dealt with people. The way that he dealt with Lot, we saw integrity. The way that he dealt with Abimelech, ultimately, we saw integrity. The way that he dealt last week with Ephron the Hittite. He didn't try and shortchange him in that interchange for that that cave. Man, he just Gave him 400 shekels of silver, the most expensive land deal ever recorded in the Word of God. What did, uh, what did Judas get for betraying Jesus? How many? 30 pieces of silver. Man, Abraham laid out 400 pieces of silver for this cave. 
He had integrity in the way that he dealt with people. And folks, that's why I believe it says the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. I'll talk about that more at the end. So Abraham said to the oldest servant of his house, some people would say this is Eleazar, the servant that we looked at back in what, Genesis 13 or whenever it was. But the problem is, this is about 65 years later. This guy would have been archaic, like a fossil, right? Older than the earth's crust. So it's probably just his next servant of his house, the one who was his chief of staff, who ruled over all that he had. Here's what he said. Please put your hand under my thigh, and I will make you swear by the Lord. Now, if it was a men's group, I could talk about what this really was all about, but it's not. So I'm just going to leave it with that he put his hand under his thigh. It was the way that they at that time really expressed sincerity, right? Right? He put his hand under his thigh, and he swore by the Lord. Here's what he says, the God of heaven and the God of the earth. Swear that you will not take a wife for my son, Isaac, from the daughters of the Canaanites, which is where they were living at the time, right? Very, very sinful people. They, the Canaanites, the Bible says in what, Leviticus 18, they had some of the most heinous practices on the face of the earth debauchery, orgies, offering their children as sacrifices to God, which is really why God didn't allow Abraham, for a whole host of reasons, to be that contrast when he asked him to sacrifice, which is what the custom of the land at times was. But Abraham knew, man, I do not want Isaac to marry one of these Canaanite women, among whom, he says, I dwell. But, he says, here's what I do want. You shall go to my country, Ur of the Chaldeans, right? Remember, that's where it is that Abraham came from. And to my family, and from there I want you to take a wife for my son Isaac. This is critical, Genesis 24. Because if Isaac, who at this point is probably about 40 years old, he's pretty old, and oftentimes people are married much younger as women, as we looked at Sarah last year, or last week, being about 15 Um, Abraham would have been 25 when he married his 15-year-old bride, all right? Very common in the culture of that day. But Isaac is 40, and Isaac is that, that linchpin between the blessings of God and ultimately the Messiah, and if Isaac doesn't have a bride, then the whole promises of God will cease to exist in terms of the covenant that God made with Abraham. Now, he's in control, God is, so ultimately Abraham comes to the realization, I'm getting pretty old. My son's still hanging around the house. Failure to launch, right? What's going on? You got to get out of the house, kid. Anyone have 40-year-olds living in your basement? Not fun, right? So he's like, you're 40? I got, please go find a wife for my son Isaac. Um, And the servant said to him, perhaps the woman that you want me to go find, perhaps she will not be willing to follow me back to this land. Um, Most people believe the most direct route from where he was in Canaan to the Ur of the Chaldees was about 500 miles. That's straight across the Arabian desert. That is some of the most difficult. I mean, if you're not prepared, a lot of people would die in that trek. So the the easier route was actually north to Haran and then back down south to that Mesopotamian valley. And that was about a 900 mile trek. Now, 900 miles in a car takes a few hours, right? Uh, If I'm not mistaken, for the most part, that'd be about 10 hours a trip, 900 miles, give or take how fast you put on the accelerator. Um, To walk, as we're going to see him walk, would have been quite the endeavor. 500 miles or 900 miles, both of them quite long. And And he says, perhaps I go that distance and I talk and she says, where are we going? No, no way, no how. What if she's not willing to follow me to this land? Must I take your son back to the land from which you came? I know you said don't take him, but if she says no, then do I got to come back and take him back so that he can meet her? And Abraham says to him, beware, and that's one of the strongest words, beware, at least in the Hebrew, that you do not take my son back there. Now, honestly, we don't know why. We don't know why, other than probably if you take him back there, the temptation might be for him to stay there because she might convince him to stay there. Hey, my family, 
You know, what's that phrase? You get, get, a, get a wife, get a, you get a daughter-in-law. You, you know the phrase. Get a son, you never see him again. I don't remember. But if you go back there, maybe he'll never come back. And, and, and so Abraham says, please, but most importantly, do not take my son back there. And the Lord God of heaven who took me, Abraham says, from my father's house and from the land of my family and who spoke to me and swore to me saying, to your descendants I give this land. Here's what Abraham says. He will send his angel before you and you shall take a wife for my son from there. And if the woman is not willing to follow you, then you will be released from this hand under the thigh oath. Only please, he says it again, do not take my son back there. The promise is for Canaan. The promise is this land. We cannot jeopardize the promises of God. And so please don't take my son back to Ur of the Chaldeans. So it says, the servant put his hand under the thigh of Abraham, his master, and swore to him concerning this matter. I promise you, I will not take your son back. Then the servant took 10 of his master's camels. Now, folks, camels were not a domesticated animal during this time. Cam camels were a wild thing. And so for somebody to have one camel, that's like you've got a Cadillac Escalade, you know, long version limousine. That's the equivalent of what one camel in this time would have been. And so for Abraham to have more than 10 camels, but to be able to take out of his camel herd, his limousine herd, 10 to give to this servant, so that that servant might pile on top of those camels wealth, a dowry, so to speak, uh, something to bless the bride's family with. Abraham was a very wealthy man, and he's going to take 10 of his master's camels, and he is going to depart from Canaan. For all, it says, his master's goods were in his hand. He controlled everything. He had the purse strings. And so it says, he arose, and he went to Mesopotamia, Ur of the Chaldees. It says, to the city of Nahor. Now, that's not the city of Nahor like we say the city of Denver or the city of Arvada. That's actually the city of his brother, Nahor. His family lived there, and his brother's name was Nahor, if you remember. And so he's saying, go back to Mesopotamia, where my brother lives. And he, the servant, made his camels kneel down outside the city. So we fast forward the 900 miles or the 500 miles. You know, he just got Star Trek catapulted right there. And he made his camels kneel down outside the city by a well of water at evening time, the time when women go out to draw water. Yes, when it came to drawing the water, it was the women's job to do it. And the wells were not in the homes. They didn't have, you know, mowing faucets that they could turn on. They, they had to actually have one well outside the city. And they would go outside the city, the women would, and they would bring jars, usually about five gallons apiece, oftentimes, as we see movies, carrying them on top of their heads, five-gallon jars. And the women would bring the water back to the tents or to the homes. And so it says the time when the women go out to draw water is when the servant goes out to sit and watch. And here's what the servant says. Oh, Lord, God of my master, Abraham. This is, believe it or not, the first recorded prayer in all of the Bible. This is the first recorded prayer that Genesis, which is the first book of the Bible, possesses. And we know Abraham prayed because it says he did, but we don't have the record of his prayer. But we have the record of his servant's prayer. Oh Lord, God of my master Abraham, please give me success this day. What would success be? What does success look like? What is he asking the success to be? Please find me a beautiful woman that I can take back, steal from this land, and take back to Isaac in the land of Canaan, right? He's not going to steal her, but please give me that success and show kindness to my master Abraham. Behold, here I stand by the well of water. Here's the deal. And, and the daughters of the men of the city are coming out to draw water. Now, let it be, this would be a fleece. You know, this would be like, God, show me a sign. All right? Let it be that the young woman to whom I say, please let down your pitcher that I may drink. And she says, drink, and I will also give your camels a drink. Let her be the one 
you have appointed for your servant Isaac. And by this, if she comes up and takes the water jar and says, here, go ahead and drink. And oh, by the way, can I get water for your camels as well? Ten of them. Now, let me tell you this. Um, I read commentaries all over the place. I read that camels, when they're thirsty, can drink, one guy said, 50 gallons of water. Another commentator said, no, it's 40 gallons of water. Another commentator said, no, they drink 20 gallons of water. Let me just tell you, they drink a lot of gallons of water, okay? And so if you've got 10 camels, let's go with the, the 50 gallons because they came 900 miles. They're pretty thirsty. That would mean 10 camels times 50 gallons that one camel could drink that's very thirsty. That's 500 gallons, right? She has a five-gallon jar on top of her head for the most part. So do the math. How many trips back and forth from the well? Thank you, Bob. You have a calculator. 100 trips. Lot. So let that be known. If she does this and by this, I will know that you have shown kindness to my master. She's going to be the one. If she, if she does this and says this, she's the one. And it happened. See why I have to read this all at the same time. Before he had finished speaking, the behold, Rebekah, who was born to Bethuel, son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor. This would have been what? Abraham's uh, grandniece, something along those lines. Abraham's brother, Nahor. She came out, Rebekah did, with her pitcher on her shoulder. And now the young woman was very beautiful. What do you, I just said that, you guys are, I know in your mind's eye, because I do it too. I see a well outside of a city, I see some trees, and then I see a bunch of women walking with pots on there, and then all of a sudden, ooh, there she is. It says she's very beautiful. There's only, I think in all of, the, all of the word of God, if I counted right, there's only like seven women in all of the Bible that were described as beautiful. Sarah was one that was described as beautiful. A whole list of other ones. Abigail was described as beautiful. Not every woman in the Bible is beautiful, right? At least as far as the description or narrative says. But when it says that Rebecca was, where is it? Where is it? Very beautiful. Okay, I don't know. Sorry. I gotta love technology, right? <clears throat> when it says she was very beautiful, it means that Rebecca was very beautiful, right? And she was beautiful to behold. And then it says she was a virgin. How do we know that she was a virgin? How did the servant know that she was a virgin? Because virgins dressed in such a way as to denote the fact that they weren't married, you know? And oftentimes they would cover their head in some cultures to denote that she is a unmarried woman, which also would denote for the most part if she's unmarried, especially during that time, not today so much, but during that time that she was a virgin. Very beautiful, a virgin that no man had slept with, known her. And she, Rebecca, went down to the well. She filled her pitcher, and she came up. Spoiler alert, how many of you think she's going to ask, can I get you some water? How many of you think that she's going to ask, oh, and by the way, can I also give your camels some water as well? Read it with me. The servant ran to meet her and said, please, let me drink a little water from your pitcher. So she said, drum roll, drink, my Lord. Then she quickly let her pitcher down to her hand and gave him a drink. And when she had finished giving him a drink, she said, here it is, I will draw water for your camels also until they have had all that they need, until they have finished drinking. Again, a whole lot of water. So it says she quickly emptied her pitcher into the trough ran back to the well to draw water, and drew for all his camels. Ten of them. This would have been a massive entourage. And the man, wondering at her, remained, wondering at her remained silent so as to know whether the Lord had made his journey prosperous or not. When it says he wondered at her, that means he watched her. He, he, he creeped on her, right? He creepily watched her do this whole thing. He could have helped her. He could have said, do you have another picture? I know this is a lot. But he wanted to see the character of Rebecca. He was really surveying what kind of heart she had, if she had a servant's heart. Now, many of the commentaries I read, and this is unfortunate, they said this is a great recipe for how it is that you should find a spouse. They tried to boil it down to, you know what, the, 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 the way that he went about this is he prayed, which is true, you should pray before you marry somebody. He, he, he surveyed, gave her a tough task, 
to see if she had a servant's heart, to see if she was other-centered, to do all these things, and we should do that as well. I'm just going to tell you, it's not probably the wisest thing to lay out a fleece before the Lord today and say, you know what, I'm having coffee with this girl. If she shows up with the Denver Nuggets jersey and then offers me tickets to the the next game, then I'm going to know, God, that she's the right one because I love the Nuggets. And if she does too, then that's a match made in heaven. I'm going to encourage you, that's probably not the way that God operates any longer. The thing that Eleazar or the servant didn't have is he didn't have the word of God in terms of direction. We have God's word and we get so much direction in our lives from God's word. Not from tests or give me a sign, God, if she has that Nuggets jersey and then maybe offers me some season tickets, I'm going to know she's the one. I mean, we, we have so many things in God's word that tells us what we should be looking for in a husband and then tells us what we should be looking for in a wife. And more than even God's word, or additionally to God's word, what Eleazar, this servant, didn't have, is he wasn't filled with the Spirit of God. Now, it did say the angel of the Lord went before him, which is good, because on his own he wouldn't know what to do. So the angel of the Lord was guiding and leading and directing. But how many of you know that we don't just have an angel going before us, we have the Spirit of God living in us. God's Spirit living in us, giving us counsel and wisdom and guidance and conviction, helping us understand, you know what, that's not my best for you. You know what, I feel that conviction of the Lord, I shouldn't be doing this, Lord, forgive me. We have some things that they didn't have or Gideon didn't have when he laid out a fleece and when he, this servant, tested or asked for a sign from the Lord. But at this time, that's how God ultimately made it happen. So while he watched her, wondered at her, he was quiet so as to see whether or not or to know whether or not the Lord had made his journey prosperous or not. So it was when the camels had finished drinking that the man took a golden nose ring weighing half a shekel and two bracelets for her wrists weighing 10 shekels of gold. He blinged her out, all right? He he took her to the jewelry counter and he said, here, put this stuff on. Why? Why? Because she passed his test, and ultimately, he wanted her to be the one to marry Isaac. And so look at how it plays out. He says to her, whose daughter are you? Tell me, please, is there room in your father's house for us to stay the night to lodge? So she said to him, I'm the daughter of Bethuel, Milcah's son, whom she bore to, oh, by the way, Abraham's brother Nahor, which is so cool. He didn't even plan this. He didn't know where to go. He just sat outside the city. He just sat and watched the well. And the very woman, as he lays out this, give me a sign, God, this fleece, she passes that. And then he asks, who do you belong to? And lo and behold, how cool it was that she was, just as Abraham asked, go back to my homeland and find a spouse for my son Isaac from my own family. And that's exactly what we read right here. And so she says to him, we do. We have both straw and feet enough and room to lodge. Then the man bowed down his head. And just as Abraham had done, probably his servant watched, he also gave thanks to God. He worshiped the Lord. And he said, blessed be the Lord God of my master Abraham, who has not forsaken his mercy and his truth toward my master As for me, being on the way, the Lord led me to the house of my master's brethren. Notice that he didn't go to that house. He went to the well, but he understood ultimately that God was leading all along the way. So the young woman, Rebecca, ran and told her mother's household these things. You know, right? Look at these earrings. Look at these gold bracelets. Look at this entourage, 10 camels, right? Full of stuff. So it says Rebecca had a brother whose name was Laban. Dun, 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 dun. Later on. And Laban ran out to the man by the well. So it came to pass when Laban saw the nose ring and the bracelets on his sister's wrists. And when he heard the words of his sister Rebecca saying, thus the man spoke to me, that he went to the man, Laban did. And there he stood by the camels at the well. Laban was a money grubber. Laban was somebody who was attracted to wealth. And he said to Laban said, come in, 
O blessed of the Lord. Why do you stand outside? For I have prepared the house and a place for the camels. Then the man came to the house, the servant did, and he unloaded the camels and provided straw and feed for the camels and water to wash his feet and the feet of the men who were with him. Laban did that. Food was set before him to eat. But he said, hear this, I will not eat until I have told about why I'm here. I, I'm not going to have any food until I get this off my chest. Here's my errand. And so it says that he, either the dad or Laban, said, speak on. Let's hear it. So the servant said, I am Abraham's servant. The Lord has blessed my master greatly, which is obvious to see, right? And he has become great. Now, we don't ever know what kind of commu communication ever happened when Abraham left 65 years earlier. We don't know if word was sent back to his family how well Abraham had done. All of the things that Abraham had participated in, his, his exploits, you know, his, his going after the, the kings from the east. We don't know if they ever heard anything. This could be the very first word that they get about how Abraham, who left 65 years earlier, here's how Abraham has done. And so the, master, or the servant says, my master has been blessed greatly. And he has become great, and he has given him flocks, God has, and herds, silver and gold, male and female servants, and camels and donkeys. And it says, Sarah, my master's wife, bore a son to my master Abraham when she, Sarah, was old. And to him, to Isaac, he has given all that he has. He is a lone heir. There's not like six sons that have to divide this stuff up. Isaac is the sole heir to everything my master has. Now my master made me swear, saying, you shall not take a wife from my son from the daughters of the Canaanites, in whose land I dwell. But you shall go to my father's house and to my family and take a wife for my son. And I said to my master, now here's the redundancy. Perhaps the woman will not follow me, but he said to me, the Lord before whom I walk will send his angel with you and prosper. He's, he's relaying all this story, right? The Lord will prosper your way and you shall take a wife from my son, from my family and from my father's house. You will be clear from this oath, the servant is relaying the story, when you arrive among my family, for if they will not give her to you, then you will be released from my oath. And this day, he says, I came to the well and I said, and here's again, O Lord God of my master Abraham, if you will now prosper the way in which I go, behold, I stand by the well of water and it shall come to pass that when the virgin comes out to draw water, and I say to her, please, give me a little water from your pitcher to drink. And she says to me, he's relaying this whole story to the family, right? Here's why I'm here. Here's why my camels are here. Here's what I'm asking. If your wife can leave or your daughter can leave and come, here's why. If she says to me, drink, and I will draw for your camels also, let her be the woman whom the Lord has appointed for my master's son. But before I had finished speaking in my heart, there was Rebecca coming out with her pitcher on her shoulder. How many wish God would answer prayer that fast? He wasn't even done laying out this, give me a sign, God. He, before he had even finished speaking in his heart to God about the whole thing, suddenly there's Rebecca. Beautiful, virgin, right? Never been with a man. Uh, she's a servant, all the things. She came out with her pitcher on her shoulder and she went down to the well and she drew water and I said to her, please let me drink. And she said, and she made haste and let her pitcher down from her shoulder and said, drink, and I'll also give you camels a drink also. So I drank, and she gave the camels a drink also. See why I have to do it all in the same week? <laughs> it's like repeating the same thing. Then I asked her and said, whose daughter are you? And she said, the daughter of Bethuel, nay her, nay her son, whom Milcah bore to him. So when I heard that, I put the nose ring on her nose and the bracelets on her wrists. And I bowed my head and I worshiped the Lord and blessed the Lord God of my master Abraham, who had led me in the way of truth to take the daughter of my master's brother for his son. 67 verses, if you're wondering, okay? Longest chapter in all of Genesis. I'm at 49. Stick with me. Now, if you will deal kindly, he says, he, he relays the whole story, very, very detail-oriented. And then he says, now, if you will deal kindly and truly with my master Abraham, let me know. Just tell me, does this story jive for you? If not, tell me that I may turn to the right hand or to the left. I'll go another way. Then it says, Laban and Bethuel answered and said, Hey, the thing comes from the Lord. We cannot speak to you, either bad or good. 
This is from God. Here is Rebekah before you. Take her and go and let her be your master's son's wife as the Lord has spoken. That sounds like good news, right? That sounds like the success that he prayed for. Hey, you know what? You've proven to us. This is an amazing story. This obviously is from God. Take her and go. And it came to pass when Abraham's servant heard their words that he, what's he do again? He worshiped the Lord. He gave him thanks, bowing himself to the earth. Then the servant brought out, here it is, right? Jewelry of silver, jewelry of gold, clothing, and he gave them to Rebekah. He also gave, this is what was on the camels, he also gave precious things to Laban, her brother, and to her mother. I mean, he blessed this family. And he and the men who were with him ate and drank and stayed all night. Then they arose in the morning and he said, all right, it's time to go. Send me away to my master. And he said to them, did I skip one? But her brother, there, that's important. But her brother and her mother said, hold on, wait a minute. Let the young woman stay with us a few days, at least 10 days. And after that, she may go. We don't know why they wanted to delay the process. Maybe they wanted to get to know these guys better. Maybe they wanted to hear the story again. Maybe they wanted more money from them. Whatever the reason is, initially it was, you bet, take her and go. Now it's like, well, hold on, you can take her, but let's give it a little time. Let's let this thing ruminate a little bit, shall we? Um, At least 10 days. And after those 10 days, she can go. But the servant said to them, please, do not hinder me, since the Lord has prospered my way. Send me away so that I may go to my master. He's like, okay, no, hold on. You guys said I could go, now I need to go. But they said, we will call the young woman, Rebecca, and we'll ask her personally. What are they going to ask her? Do you want to go? Then they called Rebecca and said to her, will you go with this man? And she said, what? I will go. You know, God knew who who was going to pair with Isaac. He knew the character of the wife that he wanted by Isaac's side. She, as we've seen, was a servant. She was other-centered. She was kind. She was generous. She was thoughtful. She wasn't selfish and all of those things. And additionally, she, just like Sarah did with Abraham, when called to leave her country, she said, what? I will, I'll think about it. I will, I'll check with my friends. I'll, I'll, I'll pray about it for a while. No. Hey, Rebecca, come in here. Do you want to go? And she says, I will go. She's never met Isaac. She's never met Abraham. She's never met this servant before, like that night. And yet she's asked, and she has the faith of Abraham. She has the faith of Isaac. She has the faith of this servant. She says, I will go. So they sent away Rebekah, their sister, and her nurse, and Abraham's servant, and his men. And they blessed Rebekah and said to her, this was her parting blessing, Our sister, may you become the mother of thousands, of ten thousands, and may your descendants possess the gates of those who hate them. May you be prosperous. Then Rebekah and her maids arose, and they rode on the camels and followed the man 900 miles all the way back to Canaan. And so the servant took Rebekah, and they left. Now Isaac, this is the first mention of Isaac since the whole Mount Moriah, you know, sacrifice thing. This is the first mention of Isaac, and it says, he came from the way of Beer Lahai Roy, for he dwelt in the south, and Isaac went out to meditate in the field in the evening. That word meditate, it literally meant that Isaac was pacing back and forth. It literally meant that Isaac was, was pondering and thinking and going back and forth and pacing and wondering. And wouldn't you be Why couldn't I go, is what I would ask. Hold on, wait a minute. Hey, Dad, why are you sending the servant to pick me a wife? I said blind faith isn't something that we deal with, but this is a blind date, all right? This isn't blind faith, but I'm going to be honest with you. This is a blind date because Isaac has never met this woman, Rebecca. He didn't get an Instagram snapshot. He didn't get a text from her. He wasn't able to check out her Facebook profile and see anything about this woman. 
He was in the dark. He had no clue. And so he's pacing back and forth. What is she going to look like? What is she going to talk like? Is she going to be fun? Is she going to be respectful? Am I going to be able to love her? Blah, 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 blah. He's meditating in the field in the evening. And then he lifts his eyes and looked. And there the camels were coming. Then Rebekah lifted her eyes. And when she saw Isaac, she dismounted from her camel. It says she got off. For she had said to the servant, who is the man walking? She asked the servant, who is the man walking in the field to meet us? The servant said, it is my master. It is Isaac, essentially. So she took a veil and covered herself so that Isaac couldn't see her face. Not close up. I'm going to tell you this. In their culture, that veil stayed on that virgin's face until the night when they consummate their marriage until they're in the tent together. So though finally he gets to see the, the figure of his wife, she, her face is covered. He still doesn't know what she looks like. And he won't know until they go into their wedding marriage tent. And so it says, she covered herself, and the servant told Isaac all the things that he had done. I'm glad he didn't repeat him yet again. Aren't you? Because <laughs> this would be 80 verses instead of 67. And here's how it ends. Then Isaac brought her into his mother Sarah's tent. That might sound creepy, but remember, Sarah's passed away. And because Sarah was the, the wife of Abraham, she would have had the biggest tent, the most grand tent, the tent that was really meant for the woman of the tribe. And now it says that tent becomes Isaac and Sarah's, or at least Sarah's. And he brought her into his mother's tent, and he took Rebekah, and she became his wife. That means they consummated the relationship. That veil, for the first time, came off. And he saw her face to face. And remember what the Bible says? She was very beautiful. And that's what he saw. And it says he loved her. So Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. And that's Genesis chapter 30, what? 24. <laughs> Isaac didn't exercise blind faith at all. It was a blind date. But I want you to know it's not blind faith. And here's what I want to close with. You say, I'm not going to go long. Don't worry, because that was long. But I want you to know when you and I see Isaac's faith, Isaac was not exercising blind faith in the servant, blind faith in Abraham, blind faith in God to get him a wife. Because first of all, Isaac had all of the stories of his father Abraham and how faithful Abraham was to his father. He would have heard all of the stories. He would have known from a young age how faithful his God was because he watched his dad Abraham exercise that faith and worship that God always in his presence. He had that to go on, and he also then had his own experiences and his own stories to tell of God's faithfulness, not just in Abraham's life, but in his own life as well. Like probably the biggest one on top of Mount Moriah, right? When his dad was ready to bring the knife down and to slice and to kill him, and all of a sudden the angel cries out, Abraham, here I am, don't touch the boy. Isaac was like, oh, thank God, right? There's a ram right over there. Go get it in its place. He had not only his father's stories to tell, but he had his own stories to tell of God's faithfulness. And he knew God could be trusted. And folks, for us today, when people say you have a blind faith as Christians, you just took a leap of faith as Christians, we have, maybe if you had parents who were Christians, I know I did, I had stories of my parents and how God was faithful to them. I grew up in a Christian home, and I watched two people, not perfect, but two people who had a relationship with the Lord, and I, at a young age, saw those things. And then, yes, at 52 years of age, I know it doesn't look it, but at 52 years of age, I have plenty of stories to tell of God's faithfulness to me individually, of God's faithfulness to me and my wife maritally, and God's faithfulness to us as a church, God's faithfulness to my family. I don't have a blind faith at all. I have faith in the faithfulness of God. 
And then something that they didn't have then, but we have today, we not only have our own stories to tell of God's faithfulness or our parents' stories to tell of God's faithfulness, we have all the stories in God's Word that I just read to you today that display to us how faithful our God really is. Amen? I mean, take the 66 books of the Bible away. Take the stories of, of Abraham away. Take the stories of Isaac away, of Jacob, of Joseph, of all the characters in God's Word, of the disciples. Take those away, and what would we know? We would only know what he knew, how God has been faithful to him and how God has been faithful to his father before him. But we have 66 books of the Bible. We have all of the stories of God's faithfulness. And let me end by saying we have what this verse tells us. These verses tell us, trust in the Lord with all your heart. This is the story I just read you. This is the the abbreviated version of Genesis chapter 24. This is everything we just saw the servant experience. This is everything we saw Abraham experience. And this is everything we saw Isaac go through and, and Rebekah go through as well. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean not on your own mind, your own thinking, your own understanding. In all your ways, how you operate, look to God. That's what it means, to acknowledge Him. In all your ways, look to God. And when we do those things, trust, when we don't lean on our own understanding, but God's understanding, and when we acknowledge Him, the Bible promises, just like we just read, He will direct your what? You know, this is not how to find a wife in today's culture, I would say, right off the top. But this is the way to learn to trust God. This is the way to know that God really does direct our steps. God really does have a plan. And the Bible says the steps of a righteous person are ordered and of the Lord. And I look back and I see my steps and I see how God was guiding me each and every day, each and every season. He knows what he was doing and he doesn't stop doing those things today. God is guiding your steps just like he guided the steps of Abraham's servant, just like he guided the steps of Rebecca, and just as we're going to continue to see, he guided the steps of Isaac and all the patriarchs as well. Don't we serve an awesome God? Lord, thank you so much for the story today.